Here follows Lesson 6 in William Walker Atkinson's The Arcane Teaching. Lesson 6 is the third and final lesson in Part 2 of The Arcane Teaching, Part 2 being called The Cosmos. Lesson 6 is called Involution and Evolution. Involution and Evolution. Now, in order to understand the arcane teaching regarding the processes whereby the cosmic will manifests in the universe of life and action, shape and form, change, appearance, and variety, let us seek the wisdom of the aphorisms. Listen to the aphorisms. Aphorism number eight. <clears throat> By the law of analogy, the manifest cosmos may be known. From one, know all. Like unto a world brain is the cosmos. Its brain substance is the substance principle. Its thought energy is the motion principle. And its mind is the consciousness principle. Its will is the cosmic will. Its spirit is the cosmic spirit. Its laws are the seven laws. Its sovereign is the law. Many philosophies have held that the universe is mental in its last analysis, and that the universal mind is the reality behind the appearances. <clears throat> Others have held that the universe is merely an imagination, illusion, or dramatization in the mind of a supreme being. But all of these conceptions use the terms mind or mental as something having no connection with material substance, the latter being an illusion. But the arcane teaching recognizes substance as being as real, as real, and as actual as mind or motion. The three being but aspects of the same thing. The three principles which are really one. And in giving to substance and motion equal places with mind, the conception is seen to be, seen to be rather more like a world brain than a world mind. For like the brain, it contains the principles of substance, motion, and consciousness. Thought is the product of these three, the action of consciousness upon substance, by means of the vibrations of motion. As in the human brain, so in the cosmic brain. As above, so below. As below, so above. From one, know all. Substance and motion are not illusions. They are co-equal with mind, in reality and actuality. There can be no mind without substance and motion. There can be no substance without mind and motion. There can be no motion without mind and substance. The three principles are always found together. In everything, the three are found. There is no separateness in the three principles. There are and must be. They are and must be always in combination. And this combination in the cosmos gives us that which may be called the world brain. Aphorism 9. In the world brain of the cosmos arises and is manifested all natural phenomena. All natural phenomena is but the perpetual action and reaction, combination and recombination, distribution and redistribution of the three principles in the world brain by the cosmic will. As in the human brain, material changes of form, shape, combination, character, and degree result from mental activities. Organic structural changes accompany many mental states. States of consciousness are embodied in forms of material brain substance. Well, so in the world brain, by the cosmic will, do thoughts become things? Desires take on material form. Ideas become manifested. Mental images become reproduced in the material and physical forms, shapes, and appearances. Mental states precede material form. Mental images precede materialization. And this aphorism is contained in marvelous scientific truth, little suspected by the majority of thinkers. Every mental state produces a corresponding material change in the structure and substance of the brain. 
the brain cells respond to the faintest mental state. The arcane teaching informs us that the cosmos, being a great world brain, is governed by the same laws as below, so above. This being so, we may see how the cosmos, while still being mental, may yet manifest in actual material and physical forms and phenomena under the direction of the mind. Capital M, mind. There is mind back of every material and physical form and appearance. Here is the reconciliation between mentalism and materialism, between idealism and naturalism. Read the above aphorism carefully a number of times. It contains the key of the material cosmos and the secret of mentalism. Read between its lines. It informs you why and how thoughts become things. Mental states produce material forms. Mental images cause materialization. Here is the key to unlock many occult doors. Can you see it? Aphorism number 10. What we call matter is but the countless centers produced by will in the, th in the, in the substance principle. Through the action of the motion principle. What men call force and energy is but the action of the motion principle upon the substance principle induced by the will. What men call thought is but the action of the will upon the consciousness principle, employing the substance and motion principles in the operation. In every reaction of the cosmic will, all three principles are employed and involved in varying degrees and combinations. The will is the motive power behind all manifestation in the world brain of the cosmos. The above aphorism states, that which some of the more advanced of modern scientists and philosophers now hold to be a proven fact. Science and philosophy is fast approaching a meeting point, where they will see that behind the activities and phenomena of the universe, there is to be found a cosmic will manifesting in the multitudinous variety of shape and form, life and action. Science and the arcane teaching agree upon this point. As a celebrated philosopher-scientist said, the material universe is but the outer wrapper behind which is hidden a spiritual creative activity, a striving, feeling, sensing, like that which we experience in ourselves. Wundt postulates the existing of a cosmic will similar to that of the arcane teaching. A recent paper by an English scientist says, quote, there is but one substance, and that is spirit. Matter, so called, is nothing but rigid places in spirit, end quote. Matter is now known to be but combinations of ions or electrons, which are held to be little more than centers of force in the ether. Thought without thinking substance and motion is held to be unthinkable. Likewise, science now holds that there is life and mind in all material substance, from atom to protoplasm. Science, like the arcane teachers, finds the three principles, substance, motion, and consciousness in everything. And science is beginning to see in energy and force the evidences of something akin to conation. Conation is the voluntary power impelling effort, the faculty of voluntary agency, etc. Or as Mill said, carnation, in other words, is desire or will. So that science is meeting the arcane teaching face to face on level ground. The symbol of the world brain is sure to come into general use in the science of the future. <clears throat> now for the inevitable question. The question which punctures the philosophical and metaphysical bubble of the pantheists. Why does this cosmic will manifest this energy, activity, desire, longing, striving, seeking, and evolution? 
What is the necessity of it all? What is the end sought for? As difficult as this question may be, and though it has been repeatedly styled unanswerable, the arcane teaching does not shrink from its consideration, but gives the logical and only answer, for the answer exists. Listen to the aphorism. <coughs> Excuse me. Aphorism 11. The cosmic will, as the world brain, seeking consciousness through its appropriate principle, manifests the natural phenomena of the universe. From a state of unconsciousness, through many stages of semi-consciousness, through many degrees of simple consciousness, self-consciousness, and super-consciousness, and still higher states in the scale, undreamt by mortal mind, on toward the highest states of cosmic consciousness, spirit conscious of itself, the cosmic will proceeds. Consciousness, in all of its phases, proceeds through change. Consciousness depends upon constant change. Consciousness always produces activity and manifests motion. Consciousness always manifests subjectively in change and motion in substance in substantial shape and form. In this, then, is to be found the explanation of the phenomena of the involution and evolution of the cosmos, with all the incidents thereof. In this is found the answer to the ultimate why. The above is one of the most important of the basic aphorisms, the one which explains the why of the manifest evolving cosmos. The answer is understandable only through the symbol of the world brain, the cosmic spirit or will awakening from its sleep of unconsciousness during the cosmic night in the infinity of nothingness seeks consciousness. Consciousness is the livingness of life. Therefore, the cosmos seeks life itself. The cosmos manifests in order to gain conscious life like the mortal awakening from a profound sleep, almost death-like in its intensity, the cosmos begins its task of regaining consciousness, which is the livingness of its life. And as to the mortal sleeper, such consciousness comes to it slowly. In order to fully appreciate the meaning of the aphorism, we must regard the nature and meaning of consciousness. Consciousness means awareness and, of course, is purely mental in principle. The aphorism says, Consciousness, in all of its phases, proceeds from change. Consciousness depends upon a constant change. Is this borne out by modern psychology? Let us see. The best authorities in modern psychology agree to this statement. To them, consciousness is a stream of changing mental states with their corresponding physical changes. The textbooks say, every act of consciousness involves a change from a past state to a present. A leading, <coughs> excuse me, a leading authority says, consciousness is in constant change. Also, no state once gone can recur and be identical with what it was before. Also, consciousness does not appear to itself chopped into bits. It is nothing jointed. It flows. A river or a stream are the metaphors by which it is most naturally described. In talking of it, let us call it the stream of consciousness, they say. Another authority says, consciousness results from perpetual change. It is impossible to maintain a uniform conscious state. A uniform sensation of pressure becomes quickly unnoticeable. The pressure must perpetually vary or the sensation will cease. And this is true of all conscious states whatsoever. All the best authorities agree in the above position. The cosmic will, which is embodied in the cosmic substance, just as is the will of man embodied in his brain substance, must constantly manifest changes within that substance in order that it may be conscious. It must do this constantly and perpetually, else it becomes unconscious when it is remembered that states of consciousness are always accompanied by corresponding material and physical changes, 
that thoughts become brain things, then we can see the explanation of the constant change in the physical world, which we call natural phenomena. The aphorism also says, consciousness always produces activity and manifests motion. Modern psychology also bears out this statement. Professor William James has brought out this point most forcibly in his works. He says, among much else on the same subject, all consciousness is motor. Also, says, using sweeping terms and ignoring exceptions, we might say that every possible feeling produces a movement, and that the movement is a movement of the entire organism, and of each and all of its parts. In short, a process set up in the centers reverberates everywhere, and in some way or other affects the organism throughout, making its activities either greater or less. End quote. It is not plain that, is it not plain, that granted the existence of the cosmic will in its aspect of a world brain, then every state of consciousness within it must produce activity and motion within it, and must also manifest the corresponding physical and material changes in its substance and organic structure? Does not this, coupled with the fact that consciousness depends upon constant change, give us in the words of the aphorism, quote, the explanation of the phenomena of the involution and evolution of the cosmos with all the incidents thereof? Does not this explain to us the workings of the law of sequence? This, then, is the cause behind the involution and evolution of the cosmos as told by modern science. In awakening into consciousness, the world brain creates centers of material shape and form within itself. Then by slow degrees, more complex form and combinations appear. Upon the created worlds appear the material appropriate for the manifestation of organic life. Then life, as we know it, appears. Then higher forms come. Then man. Then, as on certain of the worlds, being much higher in the scale than man, appear and then on and on and on, ever in an ascending scale of life and being, shape and form, combination and degree. In the world brain, there are many planes of consciousness, just as there are in your own brain mind. There are the instinctive planes, and those still below, the subconscious, and those above, and the superconscious, and, the other, and other stages of which man does not yet, does not yet dream just as the various brain cells perform their various their several functions varying in the degree of importance and function so do the various centers in the world play, world brain play theirs in the same varying importance and degree each is a part of the all and there is a relationship and interdependence between all none is alone and separate separateness is an illusion all is one the part played by man, by you, in this great cosmic drama, will be considered in the succeeding parts of this series of lessons, and therein will be taught the lesson of man, know thyself. In considering the world brain, do not make the mistake of the average person in thinking merely of this speck of dust called the earth as being all that is included in the cosmos. In the cosmos are contained an infinitude of infinitudes of universes, of suns and planets. Space itself must be exhausted before the universes are exhausted. Number itself must be exhausted before their number is exhausted. Remember, they are the products of infinity, and consequently their number, degrees, and variety is infinite in extent and possibility. <clears throat> Nor should you make the mistake of explaining of the cosmos in terms of time, except as a convenience in thinking. Conceptions of finite time or space have no place in the consideration of the cosmos. That is, the mind is unable to think of a period of time sufficiently great to cover even one phase of the cosmic process. The cosmic day is unthinkable in figures. 
The highest figures possible to the mind of men would not represent the year periods involved in a single second of the cosmic day. We are still in the dawn of the day, and yet that which men would call an eternity has passed in the present cosmic day. Thought fails us. We are dealing in terms of infinity. The symbol is the symbol that looks like an eight on its side. In this lesson, we have heard the answer to the ultimate question of why of the cosmos. We have seen that that answer is necessity and law. It is the law of the cosmos that the cosmic will should desire and will to live, and that in order to live, consciousness, the livingness of life, is necessary, and that in order to gain consciousness, continual and constant change is an actual necessity. And this constant change produces the phenomena of the manifest cosmos, in a nutshell. The cosmos manifests in order to live, and it lives because life is a necessity of its nature under the laws and subordinate to the law. This is the arcane answer to the unanswerable question of the philosophers of the schools. <clears throat> and in the arcane conception of the world brain of the cosmos, we have another great fundamental truth stated in simple terms and by a familiar symbol. The human brain as its analogy in the world brain. In this arcane teaching, we may understand the principles of the embodiment of mind in matter and the action of mind upon matter by means of energy. Compare this teaching of the world brain with the teachings of science in its phases of inorganic evolution and organic evolution and see how the teaching throws light on the whole process. See how there is ever a mental action preceding the physical manifestation. Desire ever precedes function, shape, and form. Mind is always embodied in substance. Substance always contains mind. The building of the crystal, the growth of the animal form from the single cell, the evolution of the chicken from the creative cell in the egg, all these are manifestations of physical action, structural change, and substance moving in response to mental inner causes. From one, know all. The law of analogy is ever manifest in the cosmos. As above, so below. As below, so above. The conception of the cosmic world brain also throws much light on, upon many phases of mental, psychic, and occult phenomena in which the world is now taking such a decided interest. If thoughts become things in the cosmic brain, then following the law of analogy, it is possible for thoughts to materialize in things on other planes of activity. The same principle is involved. The principle of mental creative activity. This is the secret of mentalism. This is the key to psychic phenomena. This is the explanation of occultism. With a cosmos, mental in its nature, with energy and substance, matter and motion, all receptive, responsive, and plastic and obedient to mind, what cannot be accomplished by those who understand the laws of mentalism? With will as the great creative power in the cosmos, what is not possible to him who understands the art of willing? With desire as the great creative energy, can we not see why desire should be harnessed, controlled, directed, guided, and mastered and employed in our lives, careers, and destinies? Apply these various conceptions of the arcane teaching to the various philosophical and metaphysical problems which have puzzled you and see how many tangles it straightens out, how many inharmonies it reconciles, how it brings order out of the chaos of conflicting theories, dogmas, and teachings. The arcane teaching is a disturber of teachings, but it is also the great reconciler. 
It is the chemical of truth, which clears the waters of thought. That is the end of lesson six.